here we go. Hi everyone, this is Rob Canzanieri, and um, I'd like to welcome everyone today to the PASS Summit uh, Data Architecture Virtual Chapter. And today I have Thomas Stringer on, you know, giving a webinar on extended events. Um, I met him at the conference and uh, he agreed to come on and it was just a really great uh, class he gave that day. So um, we're going to record this session. You can always go to Data Architecture Chapter at SQL Pass and view it. And if you want to go to my webinar, my website is here. And, uh, and, and I, I archive this information in two places, so you can go to either one. So Summit's coming up. And um, everyone, uh, they gave me a, a coupon, I mean, this code here at the bottom of the screen on, in red. And it, it'll enable you to save uh, 150 bucks. So uh, when you sign up, if you use this code, it'll save you some money going to the session. So PASS, you know, they have a lot of virtual chapters. And uh, here's, you know, some of them. If, and if you're interested in other topics like big data or, uh, uh, you know, other topics here, Russian, Spanish, uh, healthcare, uh, you can go to the PASS website and sign up and see their webinars. And um, here's a list of the events, and we're the last event for this month that they gave me. So, um, you know, thank you for attending. So with that, um, I want to welcome Tom to our session, and I'm going to pass the uh, controls over to him. Tom, you there? I am. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rob, for uh, uh, that introduction there, and, of course, for uh, inviting me um, to this uh, session. So I'm going to go ahead and show out my screen. Let's see here. Let me know when, uh, Rob, let me know when you can see my screen here. It, it just came up, and okay, cool. uh, we're, we're good to go. All right, great. Well, uh, just, a, just a quick introduction of myself. Um, I am Thomas Stringer. I am a uh, SQL Server Support Escalation Engineer with Microsoft. And uh, like Rob talked about, um, I gave this, uh, this session at the SQL Pass Summit, and um, it, uh, it got some good reviews, and I think it's definitely great information uh, for, for all of us SQL Server types, especially those of us, you know, in the trenches and uh, kind of dealing with problems with SQL Server uh, day in and day out. So what we're going to be talking about today is uh, troubleshooting SQL Server with extended events. And uh, before we get this kicked off, um, if anybody has any questions throughout the, uh, throughout the session here, just feel free to type in the chat. I should be able to see it, I believe. Um, and uh, Rob will also be keeping an eye on that, but uh, um, we might be a little bit pressed for time. This, this was a, an hour and 15 minute session, uh, but um, I've definitely tried to tailor it down to an hour here, so hopefully we don't run over too much, but uh, uh, definitely feel free to let me know if you have any questions uh, as we progress through this material. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, basically, it, we're going to talk about extended events. Uh, we're going to kick this off with why use extended events, and then we're going to uh, segue into a little bit of the brief overview and architecture of extended events. Um, but uh, what the, the real heart of this session, and I think the real value of this session, is uh, the actual uh, common troubleshooting uh, scenarios and approaches that uh, myself as a SQL support engineer with Microsoft, that these are things that I do day in and day out, right? These are problems that, um, you know, oftentimes they, you know, even for us support engineers, they, they keep us like scratching our heads. Uh, and likewise, extended events can and has led us to these solutions really quite quickly. So really good information there. And um, I think those demos will really, uh, uh, you know, show some great value for extended events. So before we kind of dive into everything, uh, you know, something that I've noticed, uh, not only, you know, in, with, with DBAs, but with that, throughout the SQL community, um, extended events, uh, as, as powerful and as uh, awesome as I think extended events is, it's really kind of had a hard time gaining traction. And I really sort of have to blame SQL Trace and Profiler for that, just because, uh, you know, a lot of us, we've been around the block, we've, you know, been troubleshooting SQL Server for a while, and prior to extended events, you know, obviously SQL Trace and SQL Profiler, those were the tools, uh, you know, that we went to for that monitoring and that tracing uh, functionality. So, you know, a lot of us, you know, we're dealing with these problems all day, every day, and, you know, when we have somebody 
that really needs to fix and really needs a solution, we naturally want to fall back to whatever we're comfortable with. And uh, you know, obviously, SQL Trace has that uh, historical place in our hearts, right? But um, I, I definitely urge you to start really maybe choosing extended events above SQL Trace. And there's there's a few reasons behind that. Uh, you know, as you see here, it's the future. Uh, it's not going anywhere, and it, it is a, a direct replacement with a lot of additional functionality from SQL Trace, right? SQL Trace has been marked publicly for deprecation, uh, so it's eventually going to be going away, right? So extended events, uh, whether we like it or not, uh, we're eventually going to have to use it to be able to uh, troubleshoot SQL Server in this particular manner, right? And that's a good thing, though, right? Because the reason extended events is you know, here and at knocking on our door, it's because there's so much more capabilities and there's so much less overhead. Um, so that's another reason why extended events is, uh, it's definitely a great solution for troubleshooting, right? I'm a, you know, I'm a support engineer uh, with SQL Server, or for SQL Server at Microsoft, and the last thing I wanna do is um, put additional and unnecessary um, overhead on my customers that I'm working with. A lot of times when I'm falling to extended events, uh, it's because maybe a machine is getting really slammed and hammered and, you know, we all hear those horror stories of, you know, say SQL Profiler that, uh, you know, can most definitely bring a, a struggling server down to its knees. So one of the things that I really like about uh, extended events is that, uh, you know, depending on how you design, you know, your, your tracing, um, solution it's a lot less overhead and it, it gives you that uh, it gives you that that comfort knowing that uh, you're minimizing that observer impact because we're there to fix things right not to make it worse so uh, you know definitely uh, definitely one of the key features of extended events that I really appreciate and another thing is uh, extended events it's extremely flexible and powerful with each new release of SQL Server uh, I mean they're just adding gobs and gobs of additional events um, to the extended events engine. So it allows us to really see what's happening in SQL Server more than SQL Trace ever was able to do. Um, so it's, it's just so much more robust, a lot less overhead, and it's, it's just where SQL's going, right? So um, hopefully with you, know, with you joining here, uh, I guess I, my, my hope would be that there wouldn't be too much convincing to uh, start to hop onto the extended events bandwagon. So like I said, you know, one of the things that a lot of people drag their feet on, especially uh, in times of trouble, is, you know, we really want to fall back to uh, things that are more familiar uh, when that, you know, that blood starts pumping, the adrenaline starts going, we got to fix things. Hey, you, what do you do? You do what you know, right? And a lot of times, uh, you know, people say to me, hey, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm really familiar with uh, the particular event or the particular uh, class within SQL Trace, and I don't really know what the name is of the, the corresponding one in extended events, and you know, it might be hard to find it, or you know, it just, it's not on the top of my head. Well, SQL Server, uh, we actually do ship um, something to help us sort of transition with that. So one of the best tools for kind of making the change to extended events from SQL Trace is a couple of uh, system views here. Uh, we have we have a way to join uh, these two views, um, the trace XE event map and trace events, of course, and it allows us to see, hey, this is what the corresponding extended event session or the extended event event name is for what we're so used to with SQL Trace, right? So that simple query on the left there, it's just it's a great mapping for events from uh, trace to extended events, and likewise with um, you know, with trace, we were used to, you know, the columns and the additional data that can be grabbed. Uh, well, in extended events, we call that something a little bit different. We call those actions. And it's basically that's data, that's data that's not necessarily natural to the event itself, but it might be additional information we need to uh, capture and grab. Um, so likewise, we, we wanted to make it simple um, to also map the, uh, the actual trace columns to extended events actions. So with these two, with these two little small simple queries here, it, it allows us to kind of make that transition a lot easier. You know, a lot of you know we're comfortable with Transact SQL to begin with, right? So it gives us that that good way to uh, reference what we're used to to what we should be using, right? So we're, we can reference SQL Trace uh, to what we can use with extended events, right? So it makes that transition a lot easier and a lot quicker. It, you know, we don't have to rely on our memory. Trust me, if anybody has a bad memory, it's me, right? So these, uh, 
you know, these, these queries definitely come into play, especially in the infancy stages of transitioning to extended events. And I just want to point out that quote there at the bottom. It's easier than you think, and it really is. You know, I think the fear of extended events is just the unknown, uh, but once you start using it, you'll, you'll find out that it's actually really a quite natural way to, um, to trace uh, within SQL Server and see what's going on. So I don't really want to uh, kind of pick apart the extended events engine itself uh, too much here, but there are a few things that are worth considering that can save you a lot of pain and, and possible heartache when using extended events here. So I have this really good uh, little flow chart of the actual event lifecycle. So up on the left there, you see that whenever SQL Server uh, in our source code, whenever we come to a, a certain point in the code, where there is a particular event that can be collected, we do a natural quick check, you know, whether we have a session that has this event enabled, right? Provided we do, um, don't get too wrapped around configurable columns. Configurable columns are, are it's additional data and event fields that we can capture, but they might not be captured by default. So you might have to explicitly capture them. So after we get past capturing those configurable column data, uh, then we come to, um, where we would start filtering out data, right? So, uh, you know, we're all used to this type of mindset with, um, you know, any form of tracing or, you know, capturing data. You know, a lot of times you want to kind of narrow it down, not just for your own sanity of consuming the data itself, but also for the, um, you know, to minimize overhead on the server itself. And so that's really what the biggest point of this, this uh, slide here is, Whenever we get to this point to actually filter um, off of event data, we're actually filtering off of the event fields at this point, right? So, um, I, like I said before, we have actions where uh, you can grab additional data that might be pertinent to you, but not necessarily natural to the event itself. Uh, but this is not where the filtering comes into play um, on the actions. So this is where we filter event data based off of event fields only. So then we keep progressing here, and then we then on the bottom right-hand corner there, you see at this point we start to execute the actions and collect that uh, additional data if it's applicable, right? So the the really the significant point here that I really want everybody to take away um, is that uh, filtering on event fields is most definitely going to minimize impact on SQL Server as well as minimizing the data that comes into your targets, but filtering on actions does not actually have the uh, minimizing effect on impact um, as a lot of people seem to think. So in other words, if you have, say, you're capturing a particular error within SQL Server, right? And uh, you have that particular um, event that you're capturing, and uh, the, one of the event fields there would be, you know, the actual message ID, right? So it's error number 1604, whatever, who cares, right? So at this point, we would be filtering that out. But if you're filtering based off of the SQL text, you're not going to be really doing SQL Server a huge favor at that point because we get past this point um, in the event lifecycle where we then capture the action data and then we would filter. And of course, as you can tell, as the uh, flowchart keeps going, we dispatch um, data immediately to synchronous targets. Um, or we then uh, proceed to buffer data for async targets. Um, so again, the real big takeaway here, if I was to summarize in one sentence, would be filter on event fields if and when you can. And if you need to filter on actions, which it's not, I mean, sometimes you just simply have to do it. Um, you, but you're not really doing a huge favor to SQL Server at that point. It's really just for your data consumption. Um, so again, filter on fields, uh, not actions, if possible, right? One of, the, uh, one of the changes in mindset for uh, extended events that's most definitely worth noting here, um, it's sort of a, a, newer, um, a newer part of the technology, what's called targets, right? So targets themselves, they're pretty much what they sound, right? They're, they're the end result of your event session data, right? So we're used to that with SQL Trace, you know, we dump to a particular file, our TRC files, right? Well, within extended events, we have, we have a lot more variety here with where we can actually put our event data. Um, and we call those targets, of course. So there's two different types of targets. There's asynchronous targets and there's synchronous targets. As you can see here, uh, you know, the first column is those async targets, the second column is the synchronous targets. Um, so within SQL Server, 
we have a lot of different options of where we can put this data and how we can store this data. So the beauty of this is store the data the way you need it. Uh, a lot of us, you know, we have this, you know, even myself, I find myself doing this sometimes. We have this knee-jerk reaction just to dump all the event data into a flat file that lives on the file system uh, just in case and just because, right? Uh, but there, SQL Server gives us a, a large array um, of other targets that can not only minimize impact on SQL Server itself, but sort of make our troubleshooting efforts uh, a lot quicker because it, it displays and it, it, uh, it provides us with that troubleshooting data in, in a little bit different uh, way and methodology. So before we kind of continue this, uh, it is worth noting that um, this session here, uh, as we get this started off, uh, it's more geared towards extended events for SQL Server 2012 and above. Um, before, before SQL Server 2012 with 2008 and 2008 R2, um, the, the targets, a lot of them are similar, but some of them were named a little bit differently. So um, if you're on uh, pre-2012 boxes, some of these target names might be a little bit different. But um, I want you to concentrate on that, uh, that quote there at the bottom there. Uh, targets are there to help you troubleshoot, not just collect data. So as you start constructing your event sessions, you know, you, you come up with the, the events that you want to capture, how you want to filter that data, um, you know, additional information you want to grab with actions. And a lot of people kind of stop at the uh, design phase at that point and then just say, all right, just throw it to a file. Well, the point of this is to take into consideration the available targets and think about the right way to be displaying that data and storing that data, not just for SQL Server, but for yourself as well. So I've bolded um, a few of these targets that we're going to be uh, talking about here and uh, displaying. Um, but uh, the, the other ones, the ring buffer, um, I'm not going to be diving into that all too much, uh, as well as the uh, ETW target for, uh, for, for extended events. Okay, so, so the, the first target that we're going to be talking about, it's definitely the most common, it's the most natural, it's the most comfortable, and it's undoubtedly going to be the target that you're going to use most, right? It's the event file. Uh, and it's, it's definitely what we're typically used to. You dump data into a file that's living on the file system, right? And there are a lot of benefits to this, and you know we all know this, right? It persists after the fact because we're, we're on the file system, and it's definitely great for all data. So if you take a look at that little image there on the right, it, it gives you a good idea of what we store. We store everything, right? So we store all the events, all the fields, and all the actions that were uh, captured during the actual session. Uh, you know, there's no rocket scientists. There's no rocket science to this. Um, it's just it's all the data, and it, it is you know, like I said, the reality is ultimately this is going to be the one you will most likely use most of the time. That doesn't mean it should be the only one you use without considering any others. So the next one I want to talk about, it's a really interesting one, and uh, it's the event counter target. And uh, this one definitely doesn't get enough, uh, uh, enough fanfare of what it deserves. And the reason I say that is, well, first off, this is a synchronous target. So uh, data is dispatched to this uh, immediately. But what I mean by data is all this one really does, it's just an incrementer. It, just, it, it increments a particular counter every time you run into um, an existence of data to be captured, right? So what SQL Server does is SQL Server doesn't actually capture the data itself. Um, it just increments a counter when it comes to that data uh, to be captured. And because of this, because of this, this incrementing nature and really lightweight, it's, it's extremely lightweight. Um, and it doesn't give you that comprehensive collection, uh, but it gives you just that, that occurrence counter, right? So in other words, uh, this is really good for troubleshooting the existence of. So say for instance, right, you know, uh, somebody's trying to move a database to an availability group and, uh, you know, at the moment, you know, we don't really support um, distributed transactions with availability groups. So you don't necessarily need to have all of the DTC transaction data, you know, uh, resident. You just need to know whether or not this database is participating in DTC transactions. So in this case, you know, a counter would be, a, you know, a really good target just to get the existence of, or maybe the, the count of it. And, you know, that picture right there, I think that's a, that's a really good description or a really good image for the event counter target. You know, when we were all kids and, you know, running track or, you know, swimming laps or something, you know, it's not, we're not grabbing, you know, how fast we swam that lap or, uh, you know, how far the distance was, all we're doing is just incrementing every time we would finish a lap. 
So that's virtually all the event counter does. Extremely lightweight, extremely lightweight. The next target I want to talk about, it's definitely one of the more confusing targets, but uh, equally, um, equally powerful. And this is the, uh, the histogram target. Uh, it is worth noting that this is an async target, um, so it is um, subject to getting buffered before dispatching the target Excel. So what exactly do we mean by histogram? All we mean by histogram is we create buckets based off of the particular data that's coming in, right? So uh, instead of grabbing all the data here, we define a particular event and then a source on that that's going to slice out that data amongst all the buckets, right? So in our case, and I have a little illustration here that it makes it pretty easy to visualize uh, how exactly this, uh, this target works. You have a particular event, right? SQL statement recompile. We don't necessarily care about all the data coming into play, but we want to know what is the actual skew of the different recompile causes, right? So in other words, I don't really need all the data. I just need to know what are the hotspots causing my recompiles, like the actual recompile causes themselves. And at this point, what SQL Server does is it creates a unique bucket for every new recompile cause coming into play, and every uh, existing one every time we would run into that, all we do is we increment that bucket. So at the end of that kind of troubleshooting, you have a good idea of sort of the weight of each source um, based off of the event data that was collected. Uh, so let's take a look at this, uh, this little illustration here. So uh, say we're, you know, SQL Server's collecting the data and we run into a SQL statement recompile event and we find that this matches the event for this actual histogram target. And for this particular one, uh, the actual SQL statement, uh, the actual recompile cause is option recompile requested. So what SQL Server does is it says, I either create a new bucket if it's the first time occurrence, or if we already have a bucket for this, all I do is increment it, right? So as, as we can see, what happens here is we go to our bucket there and we increment our option recompile requested bucket plus one. Likewise, we have another one coming in, SQL statement recompile. This time, though, it's set option changed. So all we do is we either create that set option change bucket or we just increment it by one, and so on and so forth. Statistics changed, we just increment that bucket. So at the end of all this troubleshooting, you have a pretty good idea of what's causing these recompiles. Not all the granular data, but a lot more granular than the event, event counter uh, without having all the additional information of something like the event file itself. Really good tool. Uh, there are definitely times where this histogram target is absolutely the most appropriate, and I'll, uh, I'll be showing you a really good demo of that soon. Okay, so the next target is probably one of the least used targets, uh, and I really like to blame that on its, uh, its name is a little bit misleading. So this target itself, it's called the event pairing target. And I think this really throws a lot of people off because, you know, you think event pairing, what, it probably captures pairs. No, it actually does the opposite. It captures things that aren't pairs. So this is really good for troubleshooting starts with no ends, right? When you expect um, a, a like event to come in for a particular piece of the data. Uh, so what do I mean by that? So event pairing gives us the end result of orphaned events. So you basically define two events that are related. So, you know, for this instance, we're talking about, uh, say, uh, you have pages are getting allocated and then pages eventually get freed. So what we do here is we say, hey, for every page allocated, um, if you don't have a page freed event, that is the data we want to see. So this is really event not pairing, right? So every time of an event actually gets paired, every time that page freed event comes for that particular page, it takes the page allocated and the page freed event and it discards them. So at the end of all of this, you have a really good idea of the orphans. This is a really good and streamlined way to um, troubleshoot things like memory leaks, uh, locks that are being held open, basically anything that you expect in it, right? And you know, locks in memory are probably one of the more typical ones where uh, you'd be troubleshooting that, that sort of natural way of the data progression as well as the SQL Server process proceeds. So what does that look like? So you have all of these, say you have four pages, these pages get allocated, right? Um, so at this point in the data collection, this event pairing target would have all of these four page allocated uh, events in the actual target itself. 
So say you get to a point where this particular page becomes free. So now we have this, this pairing was made between this page being allocated and this page being freed. So what SQL Server does is SQL Server just discards that pair there. So at this point, that data, since it was paired, now gets discarded. Likewise, we have another page that becomes freed. It links up with its uh, starting pair of being, page being allocated, and SQL Server then just discards that. So at the end of all of this, we have the page allocated events that didn't have page freed events. So again, this is just, it's a really good solution for um, troubleshooting, uh, you know, those orphaned events. So we uh, basically, we spent some time there talking about, you know, why do you use SQL Server, or why do you use extended events? Um, you know, uh, a little bit about the architecture uh, to minimize, you know, the impact on SQL Server as well as, uh, you know, the different targets that we can use. Uh, but uh, like I said before, uh, the, the heart of this uh, session here is to show a bunch of demos and a bunch of real world scenarios that myself as a support engineer, I've run into where extended events uh, gave me the answer really quickly and really efficiently. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna run through uh, a handful of scenarios. Um, these are these are scenarios that a lot of us have probably dealt with uh, numerous times, right? So this first scenario is uh, a unique index uh, violation. So say you have you have an you know Bob from the application team. He comes to you, and what do we hear from the application teams all the time? Hey, I'm I'm getting a SQL Server error, uh, and I don't really know what's causing it. Uh, you know, I'm not sure what actual transact SQL is causing this issue. In this case, uh, you can insert a duplicate key row into a particular table. Um, and uh, the application team, you know, uh, appropriately, they want to know what is the transact SQL that's actually causing this issue. So maybe they can take it back to the application team, push it further, look through their source code, do whatever it is that they do, right? So at this point, what you want to do is you want to create uh, an extended event session that uh, it captures the error reported event. So the error reported event is undoubtedly, undoubtedly going to be uh, one of the most common events that you will most likely be capturing. Uh, and it's basically just, uh, it's when SQL Server, you know, runs into an error, errors that we're used to that we see all the time. And um, in this case though, we need to add a little bit of data. And the reason I say that is because the application team, they want to know what the transact SQL statement is that's actually causing this particular issue. Well, that data doesn't naturally come with the error reported event. It's just simply not an event field. So what we want to do is when we grab this event, uh, we want to go ahead and reach out and grab the SQL text for this event. And like we talked about before, um, it's prudent not only to SQL Server, but also for preserving our sanity. Uh, we want to filter this out, right? Uh, he didn't ask us for all of the errors that are getting thrown on SQL Server. It's just a particular error. So what we can do is we can look up that error number. We find out that it's 2601. And uh, what we want to do is we want to create a predicate based off of that particular error number. So everything else, we don't care about. We don't want to know. We don't want to capture it. We don't want to troubleshoot it. We just want that uh, 2601 error to come in uh, to our uh, target data. And this is good because uh, error reported is a great example of an extremely chatty event, right? If you don't filter this, not only, you know, will SQL Server have to do that additional work, but I mean, I know I surely don't want to look through um, an extended event log where uh, all of the, er the errors reported were uh, actually captured in the target. In this case, um, a, a, good a good target for this would be an event file, right? We care about the actual tr transact SQL text. We don't really necessarily need to aggregate any of this data. So I'm going to go ahead and show, um, show a quick little demo of what this would look like. Okay, I'm going to... Let me go ahead and maximize this a little bit. Okay, so um, before we kind of dive into this, uh, just due to the nature of this being a technical session, I did, uh, I do go towards Transact SQL itself um, instead of using the GUI, uh, just, just for the flow of the session, but also I'm a huge proponent of actually scripting out these sessions and, uh, you know, writing them manually. 
Uh, we do have the support within Management Studio to just create these. Um, I think Hey, Tom, are you there? Tom, we lost um, your uh, voice. Can you hear me? Uh, it's coming in now. Okay. That was weird. Yeah, right. it is. Okay, you're back live. Okay. Hopefully you didn't miss too much of that. Uh, you were just starting up saying why you were scripting stuff out, and okay, then it cool, went blank. Cool. Great. All right, Rob. If if it does go silent, let me let me know again and sure I'll to toggle that mute button again. I must have hit a. Hit oh no problem. Button. Thank you. Okay. Oh no problem. Thank you. So anyways, so I like to uh, I like to script out these events. I think it's a great exercise. If scripting or basically writing events manually with SQL Trace was impossible, if not improbable, right? Um, so anyways, what we want to do here is we want to grab the error reported event. And uh, like we said, what we really need to do is we need to capture that SQL text data because ultimately that's the data that the application team is really looking for um, to take back to, to their side uh, in order to, to troubleshoot that. Uh, and like we said, we don't want to capture all of the data. We don't want to capture every single error reported that SQL Server is throwing up at us. So what we do is we just filter that error number based off of 2601. And like I said, I'm just going to be dumping this data to an event file. So let me go ahead and create this session. Okay. Kick off my demo. Okay, so now what I do for this session is I like to query the actual target data um, through Transact SQL. Uh, Management Studio 2012 and above uh, has the capabilities to consume this data. Um, so we do have the GUI support for this uh, to, to show the event data. But a lot of times, especially with like toolbox queries and toolbox um, events, it's good to kind of have these um, XML queries uh, available and ready to uh, kind of just parse through that data real quick if you know exactly what you're looking for. So as we can see here, um, the application is uh, it's running all of these particular SQL, SQL statements that's causing the error that the, uh, the application team really cared about, right? So we can tell here that that 2601 error is coming into play, uh, cannot insert duplicate key row and blah, blah, blah. And, but the, the data that the, the application team really wants to know is what is the SQL text that is actually causing that error. So with that really simple extended event session, uh, now we have the actual Transact SQL um, data dump of what is actually causing this error. So this is a really quick and easy way to find out that information without having to jump through hoops or um, you know, do any additional troubleshooting that's, that's unnecessary at this point. Okay, so uh, the next scenario is, is another common one, especially for maybe development DBAs. Um, so uh, sometimes, you know, with these, with these application teams, uh, they care about uh, store procedure performance, right? They don't just care about it for uh, baselining, but a lot of times they want to get the, you know, their, their fingers on the pulse for how their particular store procedures are performing at a particular time, right? So in this case, you have an application team uh, that cares about a particular store procedure, DBO, employee data retrieval, and they want to get a, an idea of the performance of the store procedure as well as the individual statements. Um, so they want to be able to look at the, the calls and the metrics and basically how the store procedure is performing um, as a whole. So in this case, uh, the event that we need is we need the module end event. So this module end is going to fire when that store procedure completes. But likewise, we found that the application team also wants to get the, uh, the, the performance metrics um, at the statement level as well. So not only do we need to capture that module end event, but we also need to capture the uh, uh, SP statement completed event, which is going to fire when a store procedure statement is completed. We don't need any additional actions at this point because these two events, uh, they have the, uh, the natural data in their event fields, uh, which will answer our questions on how this store procedure itself is performing. Uh, so here's, here's another good example of where you would most definitely want to use a predicate, not only from the chatty nature of 
you know, a busier system with store procedures getting executed uh, constantly, well, we simply only care about one particular store procedure. So we're going to create our predicate on uh, object name to be employee data retrieval. And again, we're just going to dump this data to an event file. Let me pull up this demo. Okay, let's let me kick off this. Okay, so like we talked about before, uh, we care about two events in this case, right? So we want to know how is the store procedure as a whole running. So we're going to capture the SQL Server module end um, event. And uh, like I said before, there are there is an idea of uh, optional event fields. They're not actions; they are event fields. But uh, unless you explicitly state to capture this data, the data wouldn't be captured. So we're going to go ahead and say, because statement for module end is uh, an event field that is not going to be captured unless you explicitly state it to be captured. So all we do here is we say, hey, you know what? Go ahead and collect statement. Um, and like we said before, we don't want to get every single um, store procedure, uh, so we filter this out based off of the actual store procedure name to be employee data retrieval. But like we talked about when we planned out this event session, it's not just a single event that we care about. We also care about the store procedure statement level, so we're going to add the additional event here as well. Uh, likewise, this uh, particular event has two configurable um, fields, uh, and that's going to be object name and statement. So in this case, uh, we also want to filter based off of the object name. It is worth making a quick note here that filtering um, on in event sessions, it's by um, the actual event, not the session itself. So you can't necessarily just say, uh, you can't necessarily just uh, filter off of object name on one of these events. It wouldn't transpire to the other events. So we just have to be a little bit redundant here. Uh, otherwise, your data might look a little, a little interesting. Uh, and again, we're going to be dumping this data to an event file. This, this particular event session, um, it leverages uh, one of the really cool and definitely super necessary things sometimes with uh, uh, tracing. Um, we want to track the causality here. And what exactly does that mean? Well, this event, right, this event has, or sorry, this session has two different events. We have the module end event and we have the store procedure statement completed event, right? Unless we have some sort of way of correlating these together, uh, it's just going to look like a wall with a bunch of state or a bunch of uh, events data just thrown up against it. There's going to be no real easy way to say, hey, these statements led to this module end, or hey, this statement was followed by this statement. That's data that we need to know. If you have a particular module end that has an extremely high duration, without tracking causality, there's really no way to know um, what actual store procedure statements led up to that poor performance. So let's go ahead and see what this data looks like. Again, I'm going to be querying the XML itself. Okay, so as you can see here, we have this large amount of data for the uh, these two these two events and their uh, their information here. So the really the really interesting point here that I want to note is we have a lot of SP statement completed. We have a module end, and uh, what I am doing is I'm sorting by. Uh, what's called the attach activity ID. So the attach activity ID is the actual combination of a, a GUID as well as a sequence number. So the GUID is going to be where all of this, uh, well, the actual attach activity ID is, is um, introduced through tracking causality here. And all I do is I parse out this data. Um, so what this means is every event with the same GUID is uh, uniquely related to the other events sharing the same GUID. And then likewise, the sequence is going to give you an idea of the actual sequence in which they were um, captured, in which they were executed, right? So if you, do this, uh, you, if you do this sorting, you can now see that, hey, you know what? These four events, these four events are somehow related, and this one came first, this one came second, this one came third, this one came fourth. So what that tells you here directly is this module end was led up to from these store procedure statement completed 
uh, events. So now you sort of have a uh, sort of have a um, like a chronological order of particular related events. So you know this event or this statement was uh, executed first, and like I said, we're grabbing the actual statement itself. So now you can see the actual particular store procedure statements that were executed when they were executed, and um, sort of in what grouping of the actual um, store procedure call they were executed with. Uh, so this is really this is a really good way to correlate data and get that uh, that really good idea of kind of what's going on. Um, let me go ahead and stop that. Okay. So here's a really good one, and this is you know one that we definitely see a lot in the queues, right? You have a lot amount or, or large amounts of recompiles, right? So uh, how often do we troubleshoot high CPU, right? High, you know, SQL Server has high CPU. You know, you do your good DBA troubleshooting work, and you find out that the high CPU is due to um, a large amount of recompiles going going on on SQL Server. So ultimately, what you want to do is you want to find out, hey, what's actually causing these recompiles. Uh, so I can look into it uh, in order to start figuring out how to relieve that, that pressure on SQL Server. So the event that you care about here would be SQL Statement Recompile. Uh, the event name is pretty self-explanatory. This event's going to be thrown when a SQL Statement is recompiled. We don't need an action. The event itself has all the data that we care about. And uh, we don't need to filter on anything, right? Because extended events, obviously, it's at the server level, right? Well, guess what? So high CPU is as well. So we want to actually not filter in this case because we want to get the full picture of all the recompiles, right? We have nothing to filter off of. So in this case, uh, we could use an event file or we could use a histogram. On my uh, slide for the histogram target, um, that showed how the histogram could um, uh, kind of grab this data and aggregate it uh, before you even take a look at it, right? So let me go ahead and kick this one off. All right. Okay, so in this case, uh, what we care about, like we talked about, is the uh, SQL statement recompile. Uh, and likewise, you'll most definitely probably want to collect the optional uh, event field, which is the actual statement that was recompiled. And that's pretty much all there is to this particular um, event, right? We don't want to filter anything. We don't need additional data. We're going to just dump it to an event file, and then we'll figure out how to aggregate it if we need to. But we're looking at this at the statement level, so that might not necessarily um, be what we want to do. So if we were to grab this data here, we find out that uh, in our case, uh, a lot of our recompiles, or the hotspot of recompiles, uh, we can we can see that it's a particular recompile cause option recompile requested and likewise it's actually one SQL statement in this point so we now have the transact SQL statement uh, and we can find out that okay maybe somebody's calling option recompile with an actual SQL text uh, and with this simple uh, event session we now have the actual the the majority reason of what's causing all these recompiles ultimately causing the high CPU so again, it's that really fast and easy way uh, to get the answer that we're looking for. So this is uh, this is one that uh, you know we deal with uh, uh, in the queues of spin locks. Spin locks tend to uh, be a little bit of a, a, a black box part of SQL Server, uh, but um, we. Oftentimes, we do see them as contributors to high CPU. So say you're troubleshooting a SQL Server uh, on another high CPU condition, and you narrow it down to a particular spin lock type uh, that seems to be spinning and spinning and spinning and possibly uh, you know, contributing to that high CPU on SQL Server. So what you might, might want to do is you might want to get the execution path that the SQL Server process itself um, is running uh, in order to get to these spin lock back offs. So in other words, uh, yeah, I mean, we, you know, as a support engineer, yeah, you know, I've got source code access, I can dive into the source, you know, I can access private symbols, but even outside of Microsoft, uh, you know, you can utilize the, uh, the public symbol server um, to be able to resolve call stacks. Uh, and it might not give you all of that in-depth information that private symbols would, but it would definitely give you a good idea 
on how to start uh, sort of exit, you know, going about maybe something that could explain itself with what's causing all these spin locks. So in this case, if we want to grab the call stack of what's leading up to these lock hash spin lock back offs, uh, we would capture the, the spin lock back off event. And uh, in this case, we do want to grab an action, which is going to be the call stack. Now, this is the call stack within the SQL Server process itself. Uh, so a lot of this might be a little bit cryptic for somebody that might not be familiar with, uh, you know, maybe that side of, you know, that, that tip of the iceberg of development and call stacks and that type of thing. But it could give you a good idea of, you know, what the actual thread is leading up to this particular uh, spin lock back off. So in this case, um, you know, spin locks are things that just happen. I mean, they're, you know, they're a normal part of what SQL Server does, um, you know, all the time. So we don't really want, we definitely don't want to get um, all of the back off events of every single spin lock type. So we definitely want to narrow this one down to the lock hash spin lock because that's the one we've identified as um, a potential problem here. So if we do a look up into the mapping for uh, this particular event, we find that the lock hash has a, a map value type of 107. And in this case, this is one of those times where um, the histogram target really shines, right? So uh, in this case, we want to create our buckets based off of the call stack. I don't really need every individual call stack laid out to me. I just want to know the, the most common call stacks that are leading up to this problem here. So before we kind of dive into this particular demo itself, um, it's worth a brief introduction of what a call stack is. So the call stack is really pretty much just a, it's a data structure. It's a, it's a stack, right? So all the frames are being pushed and popped onto the particular call stack. So the most recent frames are going to be at the top of the stack uh, and likewise. So a lot of people are probably familiar with that, but here's a, a nice little uh, illustration to show what exactly a call stack is. So now SQL Server isn't going to just give you the actual particular functions in the frames resolved. Uh, with, there is a little tweak, which is definitely not advisable. Uh, but um, what SQL Server gives you with this call stack, it gives you the, uh, the address within the actual process uh, for, the, for the particular frame. So uh, what you would see when you grab that call stack data, you wouldn't see the really friendly names of the functions and something that might kind of speak volumes to you. What you would see is you'd see the, on the left there, basically that address. So the way to resolve this would be to take a, a crash dump within the actual process, and then you would load that crash dump within Windabug, um, and what that would do is, provided you have your, your symbols path, uh, pointed to the public symbol server, you'd be loading in the correct symbols. And then at that point, all you do is you would call an LN on each of those addresses, which is going to be locate, uh, locating the nearest symbol based off of that particular address. So I know that probably is a lot to consume, but let me, let me show you what that looks like. Okay, let's see here. So, all right. So this is what, uh, well, this is what the actual session itself. Let me get out of that view. So this is what the action itself or what the, the actual event itself would look like, right? So all we're doing is we're capturing the spin lock back off event um, and we're, we're grabbing the call stack, but we're only getting this data for the lock hash spin lock type. And again, we're dumping this data into the histogram target. So with the histogram target, like we talked about within the, the you know, the actual target slide deck, um, we need to specify the filtering event name, which is going to be spin lock back off, and the source, which is going to be the call stack. So we're, we're creating buckets and we're grouping off of the call stacks for uh, the particular spin lock back offs. So let me see without kind of wasting too much time here, because we are running out of time. I think I probably have some data here. Okay, I do. So if you were able to reproduce this event, or if it's something that always happens, you would basically be, uh, you'd end up with data that looks like this. So you'd, like we talked about, you have all the address, the, the address frames here, um, and you would have obviously the actual bucket count in this case. So you would care about the ones that are the most uh, common uh, call stacks for the particular um, event that you're, you're running into. So in this case, uh, the easiest thing to do to construct the, the, loc the, the wind debug commands uh, it would be to pop open your, your favorite uh, uh, text editor, and all you do is just uh, inject those, those wind debug commands. In this case, it's going to be ln for locate the nearest. So like we talked about, 
uh, what we need to do is create or we need to generate an actual crash dump within the SQL process and then what we do is we would load in that crash dump and then provided you have your symbol path set up correctly in which case mine is looking at the uh, uh, the public symbol server and all I do is just copy and paste my um, my ln commands. So what SQL Server does, or well, what WinDebug at this point does is it resolves and it locates the nearest symbol for that particular addressable call stack here. So like we said, the call stack these would be the oldest. This is the bottom of the stack here. So let's look towards the top of the the more recent. Uh, um, calls that uh, this thread was making here. So as you can see, you see you see particular things like uh, LockDB, uh, OpenDB, and without really sort of digging into this, because this is pretty much as far as you can take public symbols at this point, you might be able to get a certain idea of what this thread is doing. We're talking about you may maybe opening a database, grabbing a lock on a database, and we're just we're able to find out about that from the actual call stack and the frames uh, themselves. So that this actual issue is from um, it, it's it's a known it's a known problem it, and it, and then looking at this call stack it might give you uh, a better ability on how to search for this type of thing um, maybe in uh, KB or something like that. So let me go ahead and get the slide deck back up. Okay, so this is uh, this is going to be the last demo here before we uh, go into the the summary portion of this and a few other tips. But uh, this one's pretty cool. Uh, so a lot of people, one of the seemingly one of the biggest most recent questions is how can I sort of do things when extended events or when we run into a particular um, event, right? So I want to execute something whenever this event pops up, right? So this particular problem is. Uh, you're working with a database and it's subject to long blocking. Uh, you want to record block processes, which you know the you know extended events naturally can do that. Uh, but you want an automated high priority email to be sent to yourself when blocking is over five seconds long. So I mean, you might be thinking here, there's there must be no way to really kind of loop into extended events data to be able to kind of hook into this. But we actually do have a way uh, natively to uh, be able to run processes whenever you run into extended events data. So, but naturally we have to actually set up the event itself. So in this case, we're looking at the block process report event. Uh, we don't need any actions. We'll go ahead and filter it down to a particular database. Uh, in this case, we're gonna be dumping into an event file, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a stream hook. So what exactly does that mean? We have what's called the extended events stream API, and we can utilize um, two assemblies. They're up at the top there, Microsoft SQL Server XE Core and Microsoft SQL Server X Event Link. So utilizing these two assemblies, what we can do is we can create what's called this um, queryable X Event data object, which uh, parts of the constructor of this object would be uh, pointing to the actual um, server that the event lives on, as well as the event name and that type of thing. And then what happens is all you do is you iterate um, this uh, queryable X event data object and every time an event comes in for that session that you specified in the constructor you enter into the, the the block of code for this iteration here so in other words whenever you run into an event you go into uh, the part of the the iteration of that loop and then you can handle that event data and you can do whatever it is that you want you want to log it to a table you log it to a table you want to send out a high priority email you send out a high priority email the you know the possibilities are complete are, are just simply endless. Okay, so let me let me show this demo here because this is a this is a pretty cool one. Okay, so say you know we, we run into this block process report event and we most definitely want to um, we most definitely want to get a high pri email when we have this blocking right. It might be something that's happening at night. Uh, well, sure, we've got our event data, or we've got our event session definition. Let's go ahead and start that. And what we need to do here is we can, let me go ahead and kick this off, actually. Okay. Right. And I need to supply credentials. 
Okay, so what we can do here is we come, we create that object, right? We create that uh, that queryable X event data object. Let me zoom in a little bit here, and it's going to be using a connection string as well as the actual particular session name, which I've already created. So all we do is we create this for each iterator, and then what we can do is we can test out the actual event data, and then in my case, when I run into an event that I really care about, um, I want to go ahead and send an email. So let's see if this one will work. Okay. All right. So I'm going to start my blocking repro. This one might take a second try. Okay, cool. So I have a little bit of verbose logging in my iteration loop, so I can see that hey, um, you know, I'm not, I didn't quite reach my five-second threshold, so keep looping around. Uh, but then I get to um, one of the events that I do surpass my five-second threshold, so I have my code here to actually send out the email. So I've got that inbox popped up here, and as you can see, sure enough, I sent um, a particular uh, email address, um, an email including my actual block process report here. So as you can see, I'm not sure if you can tell, maybe it's not quite big enough, I don't think I can zoom in real quick here, but this is a high pry email that includes the pertinent block process report that I care about. Uh, you know, this is, this is, this is definitely uh, directly consuming data and all we've done is we've used a, a pretty simple PowerShell script to um, kind of hook into this extended events data um, to have custom custom logic for execution in my case sending out a high pri email so that's pretty much that's that's pretty much all there is to it so that's definitely really cool and powerful stuff one of the one of the lesser known capabilities here so looks like we have about four minutes left here so I'm gonna really churn through this super fast so you know people that uh, at the top of the hour need to get uh, uh, get going can hopefully see the end of this here. All right, so um, now naturally with extended events, there's hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds. I, I've, I've, it's been a while since I've checked, but I think SQL 2014, it's got, I think it's like over 800 events, right? So there's simply no way to remember this, but ultimately uh, you're going to be using a handful of events, a handful of events most of the time, like we talked about error reported, uh, SQL statement completed. These are things that, you know, these events here are, you're going to use 90% of the time. The other 10% of the time, uh, you're just going to have to figure out what the event is that you need. There's a couple of ways to discover the uncommon events. You can use the actual Management Studio GUI. If you were to go create a session itself, uh, this gives you capabilities to search the actual event names. And likewise, if this, this drop down here, you're also able to search the description. Uh, if you want to broaden the search a little bit, or if you just wanted to use uh, traditional Transact SQL, there's a, a large amount of um, DMVs that you can use to uh, grab and search uh, different events and, and packages and map values uh, and that type of thing. Okay, so uh, at the end of this, uh, hopefully you have a pretty good idea of what extended events can do. Um, I, I would think that you most definitely have a good idea of, as a SQL support engineer, I, you know, this is stuff I use. This is stuff that I use day in and day out to figure out customer problems and to solve cases uh, really quickly and in a very narrow way, right? So, you know, a lot of times this is definitely the right tool for the right job. Uh, definitely step outside of the, the SQL trace boat and, you know, hop into the extended events. Uh, this is extremely powerful stuff, and you know, hopefully, this has given some uh, uh, of idea of what you can do. And don't fear, don't fear the new way of thinking and troubleshooting with with uh, with the engine. And most definitely, you know, uh, don't uh, fear querying XML because a lot of times, with you know, maybe some cookie cutter or toolbox sessions, or even ones that ship a SQL Server, right? Um, I have a, you know, I have an XML query that um, that parses out the always on health. Uh, session. It's something that I don't even need to fall back to a GUI. Uh, it's that query that will give you that data with system health, same way, right? So I think I did pretty good on time here. I have about two minutes left. Um, it, if anybody has any questions, you know, I, I, I have plenty of time here to go over the top of the hour. Uh, but um, uh, I'm not sure. Rob, can anybody even speak here? Or uh, is it all... Well no, it's all question and answer, and we have a few questions here. Okay, cool. Uh, let me let me see. I'm not sure. Um. Yeah, it's on the question tab. Question tab. It's above the chat. I think above chats. You know what? Do you see my? Do you see it here? 
no, it doesn't show it on your screen. Oh, it doesn't show it? No. Okay, cool. So you tell him a rookie here with go to meeting. All right, can you I'll tell you what, can you just read out a few, Rob, for me? Sure. Okay, so um I'll do the really easy ones really quick. Uh, okay, the session sure. is recorded, and we're going to post it to the website. That, I got that several times. Cool. Um, so let's see. Some people are asking about the slides. Um, I don't know if mm -hmm. you'll post them or not. Uh, yeah, I can, I'll can. i tell you what, Rob. I can send them to you, and then you can uh, um, distribute them as, as desired. Okay, that's great. Uh, we, we do have one kind of uh, question that's interesting here. It says, okay. I have a vendor database. Basically, mm -hmm. running backup commands, it causes timeouts, freezes I/O uh, messages. He wants mm -hmm. to figure out how if extended events can capture that. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, in that case, you know, you'd be looking for um, you know SQL statement starting because if it's timing out, right, you wouldn't come to uh, a completed event. Uh, likewise, I think uh, with uh, extended events, it'd be I think there's an, an attention um, event that would give you like client aborts and uh, that type of thing, right? Because timeouts are naturally going to be uh, enforced from the actual client side. So uh, SQL sees that as you know an abort, uh, but you'd be able to correlate that. So in other words, if you know that the timeout is a 30 second timeout or a five minute timeout or, or whatever it is, uh, you, you'd be able to kind of uh, correlate that data. But uh, yeah, most definitely extended events would would definitely shine there. Now, um, whoever asked that question, uh, you do see my email address right there. If you would like a lot more further information about how to troubleshoot that, just send me an email and we'll most definitely dive into that one. Okay, that's really the last one I see that we okay. didn't answer. We kind of, cool. you answered several of these questions while you were right, going on the right. session, like what version of SQL can use extended events. Got it, got it, got it. Yeah. And it looks like most of these we've uh, covered during your presentation. However, what I'm going to do is I'm going to wrap all the questions up and just forward sure. them to you so absolutely. you can review them since you can't see them, unfortunately. You know. Uh, yeah, okay, perfect. No, that's um, absolutely perfect. And, you know, for anybody that if I didn't answer your question or if you figure out a question in 20 minutes or 20 days, uh, just send me an email and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it till, till, uh, till your, your question's answered. So I definitely have an open inbox policy. <laughs> Well, thank you. I can't thank you enough for coming on today. It's been great. Uh, Rob, pleasure is all mine. Thank you. And, and um, as always, I'll extend this uh, invitation. If you ever want to come back, uh, you're welcome to uh, Perfect. come back I appreciate and that. have another topic. We'd love to have you. Uh, this was just, to me, it was great. And um, and uh, I, I, I want to say thank you from this past community for sharing. Excellent. Uh, my pleasure, Rob. Thank you for having me again. Okay, so we're going to shut it down now. Um, I'm going to stop the recording. I hope everybody has a great Friday and enjoys the weekend. Um, thanks for attending, and uh, hope to hear you, see you all or come back to the next virtual event. Thank you. Bye.